Session 2. Behind every great achiever, there's another achiever. It may be someone close to home, a parent, teacher, or friend. It may be someone who's currently famous. Or it may be a historical or mythological figure. There are probably many young cadets at West Point and Annapolis today who secretly dream of someday repeating the astonishing feats of General George S. Patton, the legendary World War II hero. Yet Patton himself attributed his success on the battlefield to great military leaders of the past. From early childhood, one of his favorites was Alexander the Great, the young Greek ruler who nearly conquered the world over 2,000 years ago. Fascinated by Alexander's repeatedly successful conquests and his dashing personal style, Patton read everything he could about the ancient warrior. Soon he came to know Alexander intimately, his personality, his leadership style, his way of thinking and solving problems, his military strategies. And finally, Patton got to the point where he could think like Alexander the Great, act like Alexander the Great, and get results like Alexander the Great. When he planned his battle strategies, Patton used tactics that followed along the lines of Alexander's greatest military achievements, and they worked. Patton was so successful in battle after battle that the Germans considered him to be the Allies' greatest weapon. Patton had Alexander the Great and his own disciplined personality to thank for his success. But Alexander himself had someone else to thank for his own brilliant military maneuvers. Alexander drew his inspiration from the mythical Greek god Hercules. After studying everything that had been written and that was known about the mythical god of courage and strength, Alexander began to pattern his thinking, personal style, and actions after him. There are countless other examples of the great learning from the great. Baseball champion Babe Ruth was once asked how he developed the hitting style that made people call him the king of the home run hitters. Ruth replied that he had simply studied and copied the greatest hitter of his time, a player called Shoeless Joe Jackson. Most, if not all, great achievers draw their inspiration, their style, and their strategies from role models. How much we eventually achieve in life may well boil down to one simple ingredient, the quality of the models we choose to emulate. All human behavior begins with models. We learn to walk, talk, dress, and feed ourselves by watching our families doing those things every day. But we learn more than simple everyday activities from the people who surround us as we grow up. We also learn how to think and behave by watching the way they do. Some people have excellent role models, successful parents, or a family friend who has achieved far beyond the ordinary. But having a role model is just the first step toward becoming a disciplined achiever. You must use that model. Make it a part of your own personality in order to succeed. This program will take you through the entire process, from start to finish. In this session, you're going to start by being given a role model of your own, a model of the disciplined, motivated achiever. You'll learn the ten dominant characteristics of that model and be able to compare your own behavior to it. And you'll also learn about its opposite, the undisciplined underachiever and why that person is destined to fail. Years of research have gone into the creation of this model. CyberVision has studied people who have been successful in business, education, science, the arts, and other fields. These people were tested for the possible presence of dozens of characteristics and attitudes. And when all was said and done, CyberVision found ten qualities that were common to every one of them. Understanding the characteristics of the highly disciplined achiever can be as inspiring to you as Alexander the Great was to George Patton. Together, they will form a living, breathing picture of the type of person who is highly self-disciplined and who gets things done. With this picture in front of you, you'll have a model to pattern your own behavior after, and you'll be able to begin to reshape your life along rewarding, achievement-oriented lines. As you listen to these ten characteristics, compare your own behavior to each one. The idea isn't to become discouraged because you're not living up to an ideal. Rather, concentrate on rating your strengths and weaknesses so you'll understand from the beginning what areas you need to work on the most. Recognize that as a Chinese philosopher once said, the journey of a thousand miles 
begins with a single step. You've already taken that first step by acquiring and beginning to use this program. Now, let's discuss the ten characteristics common among highly disciplined achievers. The first characteristic of a self-disciplined achiever is a strong, well-defined sense of purpose. The self-disciplined person knows precisely what he or she wants and will go for it, even if it means sacrificing other things in life to get it. Take Norwegian explorer Raoul Amundsen, for example. In 1887, when he was a boy of 15, Amundsen read the story of Arctic explorer Sir John Franklin. He was so inspired by Franklin's adventures that he secretly resolved to dedicate his life to polar exploration. And since no man had yet physically found the South Pole, Amundsen set his sights on being the first. His mother had other ideas. She wanted her son to be a doctor and insisted that he attend medical school. At first, Amundsen gave in, but then, unhappy and frustrated, he quit school, joined an exploration party, and went to sea. Amundsen spent years apprenticing in the treacherous Antarctic. It was hard physical work, and there was a lot to learn. He studied nautical techniques until he became a master sailor, and then he began to organize his own expeditions. Twenty-four years after Amundsen chose his goal, he succeeded in achieving it. In 1911, he became the first man to find the South Pole. Contrast Amundsen's single-minded pursuit with the profile of a person who isn't sure what he or she wants to accomplish. The purposelessness personality drifts through life uncertainly, always searching, never finding. This is the type of person who changes jobs, leaves relationships, and starts projects but never finishes them. It's someone who never stays with anything long enough to become successful at it. People today are becoming more and more afraid of commitments. They're afraid of committing themselves to one career. They're afraid of committing themselves to one relationship. They're even afraid to commit themselves to staying in one place for very long. They talk about leaving their options open. Ironically, these people are very much committed to failure because without a sense of purpose, they can't apply themselves to any one thing, and without applying themselves, they can never succeed. Look around you, and you'll see 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds who are still jumping from job to job, from relationship to relationship, always searching for an answer somewhere. They'll never find it. The second characteristic of the self-disciplined person is that he or she seeks out and uses positive role models, often called mentors. Patton found and learned from Alexander the Great. Roald Admanson got his inspiration from Sir John Franklin. To be self-disciplined, you must find a mentor who can inspire you with his or her own example of discipline. This person will instill you with a sense of real possibility, the belief that if he can do it, so can I. The person who has no self-discipline tends to identify with and tries to emulate people whose values are quick fix. The undisciplined think success can be achieved through gimmicks, luck, or who you know. For this reason, they actually distrust and resent the truly successful. They cannot bring themselves to admit that it takes hard work and consistent effort to reach a lifelong goal. Rather than working to get their own lives in order, these people blame their lack of success on bad breaks. They will always have bad breaks until they give themselves a break. The third quality that distinguishes the self-disciplined person is the strength of his or her imagination. Self-disciplined people use a goal-setting technique called sensory vision. Robert Kennedy's immortal words explain it very well. Kennedy, himself a highly disciplined achiever, said, Some men see things as they are and ask, why? I see things as they could be and ask, why not? The key to developing this kind of vision is learning to use your imagination in a clear, creative way. Once you've decided on a goal, you must learn to visualize the outcome with strongly detailed, sensory-rich images. You must learn to clearly imagine the rewards of success through sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. The French have an expression, déjà vu, which means already seen. The self-disciplined, when they reach their goal, have this sense of déjà vu, 
because they have already been there thousands of times in their imaginations. You can be sure General Patton knew what victory felt like long before he fought his first battle. And for Roald Amundsen, reaching the South Pole must have felt like a homecoming. The great film director, Alfred Hitchcock, said that the actual process of directing a film was almost anticlimactic for him. By the time production started on each of his films, he had already visualized every single frame and every single camera angle so clearly in his own imagination that making the movie consisted of just going through the motions. Hitchcock began each project with a template of what he wanted clearly and firmly set in mind. Those who lack self-discipline also lack vision. They have only the vaguest images of goals they might, maybe, someday want to achieve. These people are quite capable of creating sensory-rich visions, but unfortunately, they tend to apply those visions to scenarios of failure rather than success. The fourth quality exhibited by the self-disciplined individual is what we call a positive sensory orientation. Achievers dwell on their own past accomplishments as proof of their ability to succeed. They won't admit to failure. In fact, it can truly be said that they don't know the meaning of the word failure. If things don't first turn out as planned, they just chalk it up to experience and keep on working toward their goal. Self-disciplined people are so eager to learn that they feel every bit of life experience just brings them closer to achieving success. They're not afraid to try new approaches if old ones don't work anymore. They never lose sight of their goal, but they're open to more than one way of achieving it. And this kind of positive attitude ensures that they will. Those who lack self-discipline waste precious time and energy dwelling upon past failures. Through a vicious cycle of negative reinforcement, they use those perceived failures as an excuse not to try again in the future. They develop a fear of failure, a fear of making the effort. And failure generates failure. If you're convinced you can't do something, you won't be able to do it. The characteristics we've discussed so far all add up to a quality called self-assurance. The self-disciplined have a strong gut-level belief in themselves and their ability to succeed that is truly unshakable. Deep down in their hearts, they know they can do it, and no one can convince them otherwise. When Christopher Columbus set out to find a new route to the West Indies, Europeans thought he was crazy. The world is flat, they told him. If you sail west, you'll fall off the edge and be devoured by monsters. But Columbus believed the world was round, and he stubbornly applied to every monarch in Europe until he found one who would finance his voyage to what turned out to be the new world. The disciplined achiever is fueled by self-confidence, but the undisciplined are hampered by self-doubt. This foreboding of failure haunts them in everything they attempt to do and effectively slams the door shut on any possibility they might have of succeeding. The sixth characteristic that self-disciplined people share is their ability to plan and organize. The self-disciplined achiever knows how to take his or her goal and break it down into pieces that can be worked on one at a time. Priorities are set and the important tasks are tackled at the beginning. This practical methodical approach is the only way to achieve success no matter what your endeavor. When Henry Ford designed the Model A, he had a goal in mind. He wanted every American to be able to afford to own a car, his car. But in those days, cars were hand-built, and the time and effort involved in making one resulted in a very expensive price tag. Ford knew he had to find a faster, cheaper way to build cars, so he patiently worked and planned out a radical new idea, the assembly line. Each person on the line would perform just one task, enabling them to perform it quickly. And an entire machine could be assembled in record time. People laughed and said it wouldn't work, but Ford had spent years planning it out in every detail, and it did work. The assembly line became such a success that other industries began to use it as well. One man's careful and patient planning launched a new industrial era. Contrast Henry Ford with the typical man on the street. His attention is scattered, and he's disorganized. 
He either has no idea what he's going to do next, or he has so many irons in the fire that he can't keep track of them all. Maybe he's trying to start a business, but he's busy hiring employees when he still doesn't have any clients or office space. Maybe he's decided to switch careers, but he's already planning how to spend all the money he's going to make, even though he's going to need four more years of schooling before he can begin to practice his new career. This type of person is wasting time and energy. Without a detailed game plan, and without following that plan as closely as possible until you reach your goal, you can spend your life floundering among half-started projects and missed opportunities for success. Many people think all you need to be successful is a great idea, but without planning, organization, and hard work, the most brilliant ideas aren't worth a dime. Which brings us to the seventh characteristic common to self-disciplined achievers, their ability to acquire the essential knowledge and skills they need to put their game plan to work. Achievers recognize how important it is to learn, and they're willing to make the necessary sacrifices to complete their own personal education. Sometimes this means going back to school. Sometimes it means spending weeks or months gathering information on a particular subject and talking to the kinds of people who can help. Sometimes it means taking a new type of job just to acquire certain skills. What it always means is a commitment to learning what must be learned in order to make a goal achievable. If you want to become a doctor, you must first study pre-med, then go to medical school, and then complete your internship before you can set up a practice. Anyone who thinks he can become a physician without doing all of those things is just dreaming. If you want to run your own business, there are ways of approaching your business education. You can go to graduate school and get an MBA. You can work for someone else in the type of business you want to start and get hands-on experience before going off on your own. You can find a partner who knows how to run a business and take on less responsibility in the beginning, watching what your partner does and learning the essentials. Those without self-discipline are always looking for shortcuts. They take weekend courses and think they're highly qualified for a new profession. They listen to one person's advice and think they've heard it all. They try to start a business without business plans. Going through a real learning process is too much trouble. Why is it so much trouble? Because the undisciplined person lacks patience. The eighth quality on our list of self-disciplined characteristics. The kinds of patience Christopher Columbus and Henry Ford exhibited. The kind of patience engineer Washington Augustus Roebling demonstrated in finishing the building of the famous Brooklyn Bridge. Roebling's father, John Augustus, was the brilliant engineer who designed the Brooklyn Bridge and began overseeing the building of it in 1869. It was going to be the first steel suspension bridge in the world, a feat of engineering for its time. But the project had hardly begun when the elder Roebling suffered a fatal accident and someone had to carry on. That someone turned out to be his son. Washington Augustus Roebling took over where his father left off. But just three years later, he contracted Quezon's disease from spending so much time underground. The illness left him almost completely paralyzed, in great pain, and confined to a wheelchair for life. Some people would have given up the project under those conditions, but Washington Augustus didn't. Instead, he moved to an apartment in Brooklyn Heights that overlooked the bridge, and he sat all day at the window, watching the work as it progressed and supervising it from his living room. Messengers ran back and forth, conveying his instructions to the workers on the bridge. Washington Augustus worked this way for 11 years, until the bridge was opened in 1883. Obviously, the younger Roebling's patience paid off, mostly because he, like other self-disciplined achievers, was not intimidated by time. Roebling would have sat at that window without complaint for 20, 30 years or more in order to finish his project. It meant that much to him. Later in this program, we'll explore further the special relationship between the highly self-disciplined and time. For now, we'd like to point out that time becomes immaterial to those immersed in pursuing a goal. Hours pass as if they were minutes, weeks as if they were days, years as if they were months. The self-disciplined do not worry about time. 
They also see time as a tool. Accomplishment takes time, and people who wish to achieve have all the time in the world. Because every moment they're working towards their goal, they know they are coming one minute closer to reaching it. And for the self-disciplined, getting there is at least half the fun. The undisciplined view time as an enemy, something to beat. You'll hear them say, I want it all now, I can't wait. Unfortunately, these people don't realize that time is going to pass anyway. And if they're not working toward their goal, they're only wasting the time they feel is so precious. The self-disciplined are persistent. This is the ninth quality that contributes to their success. They have what it takes to stick to their vision through thick and thin, day in and day out. They don't give up in spite of rejection, hardship, setbacks, or other people's opinions. They are relentless in their pursuit of their own dreams and goals. The self-disciplined are actually very stubborn. They succeed against all odds. When they get discouraged, they draw new inspiration and motivation from their sensory-rich visions of success. And that's enough to fuel their emotional drive to keep on making the effort. Ellie Hawkins, a mountain climber, is a good example of someone who just wouldn't give up even when the odds turned against her. She set out to climb a particularly difficult face of Yosemite's treacherous El Capitan. Ellie undertook this climb to prove that dyslexia, a learning disorder from which she suffers, can be beaten. In the middle of the climb, Ellie slipped and suffered a rope burn on her left hand that was so bad she almost lost complete use of the hand. She could have stopped there, but she didn't. What started out to be a six-day climb turned into a torturous eight-day ordeal as Ellie worked with one hand, holding her wounded arm above her head to lessen the pain. Ellie reached the top and immediately announced plans to tackle another very difficult climb. No one doubts that she'll do it because she has the hallmark of a disciplined achiever. The undisciplined are easy quitters. They give up when the going gets rough. They're more interested in having a good time than in working. Even worse, they find it impossible to have a good time when they are working. This brings us to the tenth and last characteristic of the self-disciplined achiever, the ability to experience pleasure while working to achieve his or her vision. These people are excited by their goals and become easily engrossed in the work it takes to get there. They're interested in learning, they enjoy acquiring new skills, and they have a good time while they're pursuing their ambitions. To the highly disciplined, there's no such thing as work. Their work becomes their life and their main source of pleasure. When they become successful, you often hear them say, I can't believe I'm getting rich doing this. It's so much fun. And most of them would keep doing what they're doing, even if they weren't making money at it. To the undisciplined, work is the stressful, painful, boring part of life that must be tolerated between periods of pleasure. These are the people who live for the weekend, who are willing to work only because it gives them the disposable income they can spend on fun. And these are also the people who don't want to put in overtime or take work home unless they're being paid extra for it. If taking on more work will only get them a promotion or a crack at a better job, they won't do it. Now that we've identified the ten qualities common to all self-disciplined achievers, we'd like you to begin comparing yourself against the model characteristics we just discussed. This self-assessment will give you a good idea of your own strengths and weaknesses. After you've finished listening to this session, turn to page 11 of your study guide and follow the instructions for using the personal assessment form you'll find there. Let's summarize the characteristics of self-disciplined achievers. First, they have a strong, well-defined sense of purpose. They know what they want. Second, they seek out positive role models for inspiration and learning. Third, they use sensory-rich visions and a vivid imagination to set the stage for their own achievement. Fourth, they have a positive sensory orientation. They expect to succeed rather than fail. Fifth, they have a deep-rooted belief in their ability to achieve. They are immeasurably self-assured. Sixth, they have the ability to plan and organize. They can break down what they want to achieve into manageable steps. 
and set priorities that let them accomplish the most important things first. Seventh, they know how and when to acquire essential knowledge and skills. They're not intimidated by the thought of having to learn something new. Eighth, they have patience. The passing of time doesn't bother them. They'll keep working toward their goal for as long as it takes. Ninth, they persevere. They're stubborn and they don't give up, even when the going gets rough. Tenth, they view work as pleasure because work is bringing them closer and closer to the realization of the goal that will be their final reward. Turn off the tape now and score yourself on the personal assessment form. When you're done, turn the tape back on. Welcome back. We hope you're not too discouraged by an honest assessment of where you stand now in terms of self-discipline. Remember, you've already taken the first steps toward making a positive change in your life, and you will experience that change by the time you finish this program. Nothing will be impossible for you once you develop and harness this inspiring and enduring power of self-discipline. And, as you'll soon find out, Self-discipline is not so difficult to develop as you might think. As a matter of fact, using this program is going to be your first exercise in acquiring it. Already, you're on your way. In the next session, we'll explore the power behind the characteristics we've just discussed. You'll learn why they're so important in developing self-discipline and what they can do for you once you have them. And you'll be further along the road toward understanding and developing the one characteristic that will give you the power of success.